I'm Becky Mayer and welcome to Transitions Body, Mind, Spirit. What transitions are you going through in your life? Is it easy? Is it hard? I, I like to use the uh, metaphor of something that I do, which is triathlons. You have a transition area. First you go and you swim and then you're in your transition and then you bike and then you get to the transition area and then you run and you hope you win, but it's part of life, the transitions. And today we have some guests talking about some transitions that have been very difficult. Uh, this is part of a two part series. The first part we had Chip Forrester talk about his life and his 19 year old sons passing away in a transition using drugs and alcohol together. And this part, part two, we have Jeff Carr, who will be speaking about hazing, hazing young people, uh, something that young people will do in, uh, in, uh, in college to become more part of a group and how it too can be dangerous and it too can kill. And Jeff Carr has a movie that uh, will be coming out and we're gonna have some clips about it. But I wanna welcome Jeff Carr. Thank you for being here. And first of all, I wanna say that you have more than a Jeff Carr name. Could you please tell us your whole name? <laughs> well, Becky, first, it's great to be here. Technically, I'm Jeff Obafemi Carr. There you go. Uh, Obafemi is a name that was given to me probably 15 years ago by a teacher I studied under who was a Yoruba priest. And it simply meant the king loves me. Hmm. So um, I asked why that name, and he said, well, you've always been respectful of your elders, and as long as you stay respectful of your elders, then people in high places will have respect for you. So I've kind of used that as a template for how I want to live my life mm -hmm. and how I want to interact with people. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to be here on Transitions with you and uh, reconnect with Chip Forrester, who I met when I was a really, really young man. Now I'm just a young man. Uh, <laughs> when I was a really young man uh, at Tennessee State University and a member of student government and working in Tennessee intercollegiate state legislature. And I'm mm. not sure if they still have that, but it was an opportunity for young people Tissel. to go down. Tissel. That's yep. right, to go still sit going. down and, hmm. and sit in the legislator's seat and meet people who were uh, in, the, in the Democratic Party mm. and go to caucus events, learn how government is run and to actually be able to be mentored by really good people and to know mm. uh, what politics was about from the inside. And so we got to meet Governor McWhorter, uh, Chip Forrester, uh, Lois DeBerry, who became a, a really important part of my life early on. Mm. And it was just an, a great opportunity to be mentored in a positive way. So I'm always excited to be able to, to sit in a stage with them. And, and of course, Becky, you're one of my heroes in a lot of ways. And I'm happy to be here to talk about some of the things that I've been working on. Yes, well, you are an actor, playwright, producer, filmmaker, you have all these hats. And could you please tell us about the movie that you have put together that you're still seeking additional distribution for? And uh, what is it about? Uh, the film that I put together is called He Ain't Heavy. And it's a play on the old Holly song, which is also recorded mm. by Donny Hathaway. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. I wanted to put this film together 11 years ago mm. uh, when I first had the idea. I didn't have the technology available to do it. It would have been cost prohibitive. And I didn't know the actors who would be bold enough to actually try to institute this weird and strange idea I had in my head. And at the time, the idea was to give a sense of what it really was like to pledge a fraternity. Pledge a uh, fraternity. To pledge a fraternity, to go through it. Hmm. Uh, I went to Tennessee State, as I mentioned earlier, and I pledged a fraternity there, Alpha Phi Alpha. Uh, I also was a member of the Aristocrat of Bands, a world famous musical organization, hmm. and the Thomas Edward Poe Players Guild, which, uh, which produced people like Moses Gunn, Oprah Winfrey, wow. uh, W. Dury Cox, and a lot of great people in school. So there was a lot of tradition there. Yes. Uh, but also, uh, going to an HBCU at the time, uh, there's a tradition of kind of pledging almost everything. 
So whenever you, you're going to pledge the cafeteria, you're going to pledge the dormitory, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to pledge, you know, the, the, the second floor of the dorm, you're going to pledge the Players Guild, the band, you're going to do everything. So there is that tradition of, and we talked about it in the first half of the show, uh, that tradition of belonging to something. Mm -hmm. and there being some sort of ritual of initiation that brings you in to a mm -hmm. larger circle. It taps into a human need that we have to belong to something greater than ourselves mm -hmm. or at times something we perceive to be greater than ourselves. So I got fascinated with this idea because as an undergraduate student, as part of a class project, I filmed a, what they call a line or an intake line of some of the undergrads who were coming into our fraternity. I filmed them over the course of eight weeks and I kind of cut it together into a music video hmm. and I gave that to them as a gift. Well, years later I found a tape that had all of the footage that I had taped. Of course, some of it you couldn't show to anybody. <laughs> but I was watching this footage and I said, God, this is, this is fascinating. This is fly on the wall kind of stuff. Hmm. And who would benefit from seeing this? And I said, well, I think the world would. Mm. Uh, if we could create a state where, a situation where people could actually be a fly on the wall. Well, you fast forward it about nine years and you see the advent of digital technology mm -hmm. uh, and the popularity of uh, websites like YouTube and uh, Facebook, MySpace, a lot of the social media, Twitter, and most importantly, you see uh, along with technology, you see the advent of the reality show, mm -hmm. which has been a bane to my existence as a parent because <laughs> somehow we've been convinced that reality shows are actually real. Ah. And having been behind the scenes as a producer on some reality shows and as a director, uh, you see that a lot of it is very much staged, mm -hmm. but because it's called a reality show, we believe it to be real, and mm -hmm. what attracts us to it is feeling as if we can be a part of somebody else's existence. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important part of the human spirit. Uh, we're voyeurs in many ways, and things we don't understand, we want to understand. All of those roads intersected into an opportunity for He Ain't Heavy. So we put together a film that basically took you behind the scenes of a fraternity pledging, uh, we wanted to do something that had a societal impact as well. So we did the story of a fraternity pledging that goes wrong, that gradually goes from initiation into brutal hazing, emotionally, physically, psychologically, hmm. resulting in the death of one of the pledgees. So uh, in order to do this, we put together a bold group of actors who divided themselves into big brothers and to initiates. Um, I used some directing techniques that, that are very cutting edge and frightened me, but huh. uh, required people to trust me and for us to trust each other as a circle. And we ended up with 40 hours of some of the most honest, realistic footage of anybody going through a play, pledge process ever recorded on tape, which we honed down to 99 minutes, mm. and it's now a feature film that won the 2012 Tennessee Spirit Award for Best Feature Film at the Nashville Film Festival. Uh, it's appeared at at least two other film festivals. Mm -hmm. uh, we've shown it on colleges so far, mm. and we hope to have a release for it in the spring of 2014. Uh, and it's, it's forcing a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, the most dramatic thing that I think happened out of the film being produced is uh, the connection to the situation that's taking place on college campuses all over the place, and that's, that's hazing. Uh, it's a secretive world. It's a world that people don't want to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a world that has been outlawed for at least 20 years. It, and could you describe laws. what is hazing? Give an example. What does that mean? You know, hazing is, it's a tough term because people define it in different ways. What one okay. person calls hazing, people say, oh, that's just college fun, that's just a ritual, you know. I thought they are chugging, chugging, you have to chug a lot yeah, of. Chugging a lot of alcohol in some cases, mm -hmm. bending over and getting wood with a paddle, uh, any number of things is just college fun. Having to, to swim through feces and sewage water and do push-ups, uh, blindfolded, all of these things are a part of college life, but many of those things have been outlawed now because of the damage that's been caused psychologically, mm -hmm. um, because of the deaths that have resulted. 
Uh, Hank Neuer, who's a nationally recognized expert on hazing, has kept statistics that say at least one person per year has died from hazing since 1970, hmm. sometimes five or six people per year. Uh, so it's something that's very pervasive and technically it's defined as any activity that would humiliate uh, another human being for the sake of entry into an organization, make them feel physically uncomfortable, uh, and cause any number of problems physically, emotionally, psychologically. So it's a tough definition, but most people who've been through it understand what it is, mm -hmm. uh, and even though they understand what it is, they deny what it is. Because if you look at institute, uh, like institutes like hazingprevention.org or the Novak Institute, the stats are there that say that 55% uh, of students that even come out of high school have acknowledged that the behavior that they participated in is hazing. Mm. But if you ask them if they've been hazed, then nine out of 10 will say they haven't been hazed mm. because the secrecy is there. And the uh, badge of honor that's placed on you when you go through this. But four months after we filmed the film and we were in post-production, the national news broke with the story of a drum major in the band at Florida a and University mm -hmm. named Robert Champion, uh, who was put through a brutal ritual called Crossing Bus C. Uh, although he was a leader in the band, he had to get on a bus, a tour bus, in the middle of the night and sit in a hot seat and be pummeled with fists, with ma drum mallets, with instruments, mm -hmm. until he survived that. And then to complete the ritual, he had to make it from the front of the bus to the back of the bus and touch the back wall in the black dark while the entire section of uh, drum uh, players were pummeling him with their fists, they were kicking him back and forth, they were beating him with instruments. He made it to the back wall and then uh, collapsed afterwards. And then of course, there's a 911 call, nobody can revive him. Uh, he died of internal uh, hemorrhage and bleeding. And people couldn't understand that. I immediately got in touch with his mother uh, and his parents and told them about the project that I was working on. Mm -hmm. They hosted a screening of it mm -hmm. in Atlanta and she called and said thank you very much because I'd never gone to college and I'm mm -hmm. not aware of mm -hmm. why people do these things. And mm -hmm. when I get the phone call that told me, Robert, he did what? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the phone call you, you don't want to ever hear. You know, it's a right. phone, I'm, I'm afraid of hearing it myself. but. When you get that call, you say, no, not my son. And that's what she told me when we sat down and talked. And she said, I couldn't understand why until I saw he ain't heavy. And that at least gave me an insight into the mindset of people who want to join. Because it's not necessarily a bad thing to want to belong. But when you have it in the hands of people who really um, may not have evolved into the adults that they're going to be when they get out of school, mm -hmm. then things can get out of hand, they can get out of hand quickly, and then uh, when somebody's laying there in the end on a football field, uh, as is the case in a movie, uh, and is the case in real life, I think it happened in 2000, uh, year 2000 here, a young man collapsed on a football field, uh, then everything gets real, mm. and then everything is brought into the present. And when it's my son, my daughter, my cousin, my friend, somebody I knew, then the impact is, is devastating emotionally, and that's when people realize we need to do something about it. So mm -hmm. I wanted to put together a movie that didn't pull any punches mm -hmm. and gave you an opportunity to participate uh, in what it's like, mm -hmm. the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm curious to ask you, just so you've done this, what has been the reaction of the National Fraternity organizations um, to to your doc documentary? I mean, I'm sure there's been some interaction. I'm curious what you would... There has been interaction and reaction. Mm -hmm. There, um, We are, we get both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, we get uh, an open uh, embrace. I think it was Phi Beta Sigma fraternity had us show the movie in front of about 700 wow. uh, of their members in Charlotte, North Carolina last summer. Uh, we. Do they, always do have they a prohibit pacing? Does, yes, does they one? prohibit, and they're okay. they're on a mission to, to stop, stop it, it. Mm -hmm. because they say, well, we can bring people in as brothers without beating them, right. without forcing them to do things that are 
inhuman. Mm. And the reaction was great. We're supposed to have a 15 minute talk back. It ended up being a 90 minute talk back. Wow. And people say, you know, well, that happened to me, mm -hmm. but I don't want to do that to somebody. And that's part of it. It's breaking the cycle of violence mm -hmm. that, that exists naturally. I mean, if we give you a green jacket and we beat you to get the green jacket, and then another guy comes through the door and we say, well, just write a check and we'll give you a green jacket. There's something about us that says that we remember mm. what we went through to get this green jacket. And we say, well, I'm not going to let this guy just write a check for it. And that's where the mentality mm. begins and the cycle continues. Uh, we've also received uh, some blowback from people in fraternities and sororities who don't want any of this discussed mm. for that same reason. Interesting. It would seem to me that uh, could there be like hazing light? In other words, you don't have to beat somebody, but it, it is a rite of passage. And is there a way to have some kind of process you go through, but it's not like you're pummeled uh, to near death uh, is there any, any anything in between or hazing, no, just forget about it, don't even do it? Well, I think there are definitely tasks that people can be given to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, memorizing poems was, was important for me because... That was hazing? Yeah, well, some people consider it hazing. Well, if you forget the first line of If by Rudyard Kipling and you have to get 13 licks for it, that's probably... Oh. You know, there's an argument that you'll learn it quicker, but... Uh, <laughs> But also, you know, those kind of things are a part of the ritual. You, you learn poems, you learn the history of the organization, you provide community service. Mm -hmm. You go out and you, mm. you participate in local, local active, you as an activist locally in initiatives that the community is doing in politics. Those are things that I think do build character. Mm. Uh, and I think the problem happens when those take a back seat to some of the more dangerous behavior whether that's uh, drinking, whether it's the drug use, whether it's the physical abuse, anything from breaking paddles on your backside to wading out into rivers. Recently in uh, Virginia, uh, West Virginia, a group of young men in an organization called Men of Honor, they told these uh, young guys who wanted to be initiated that they had to make it across the river holding each other's hands, and they did. They, they went into the river, and two of them got caught in the undercurrent and mm. passed away. Mm. Uh, when you think about students like Robert Champion at FAMU and what happened to him, when you think about uh, Donnie Wade at Southeast Missouri State with uh, fraternity there, when you think about Richard Harris, the same thing, uh, when you think about other people who are not in fraternities, but sororities even. Mm -hmm. uh, Kristen High, Kanitha Safir, they were on the West Coast doing some practice that was not a policy. It's, it's hardly ever the policies of the fraternity. That's the thing. Right. It's never the policies, it's the practice. They had a practice where they led these girls into uh, the Pacific Ocean with blindfolds in the middle of the night and the riptide caught their entire line and two of them couldn't recover and mm -hmm. most of the line couldn't swim. And so those two girls mm. lost their lives. And these things happen. And unfortunately, it's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of when it's going to happen, right. mm. uh, if the behavior is not, uh, is not caught head on. And sadly so, I know it's the case with Pamela Champion and other parents that I've encountered when I've talked to, about this issue. Nobody wants to assume responsibility right. for being able to stop it. Right. And so. They don't offer condolences when they should. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. offer assistance where they should. Everybody wants to back off and say, well, that student was acting on their own. Mm -hmm. And they discount the group think yeah. of mm -hmm. participation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even within the group, uh, nobody wants to accept responsibility because number one, uh, it just didn't happen to fall on their number that night. Mm. They don't realize that it could have actually happened to them. Just mm -hmm. one move to the left, one move to the right, one, one inch up and they would have been paralyzed by a paddle. Mm. Um, one gram off in the mixture of a drug, get kids mixing drugs who are not pharmacists, who are mm -hmm. not medical right. doctors, who are just doing what they've seen people do and it could have happened to them. So mm -hmm. I think that that is a fearful thing because mm -hmm. in, in defense of students at that age, nobody leaves their dorm, Nobody leaves their house, fraternity house, sorority house that morning saying, 
I want to participate in helping take somebody's life. Right. right. Nobody does that. Right. Well, you know, the interesting mm -hmm. thing to add to that is just students at that age, um, their, their brain is a portion of the brain that's not fully developed until you're right. 25. Mm -hmm. right. So the, the, the self-monitoring that we as adults have right. don't really exist between the ages of 17 and 25, and it, and it comes in to the, to, to the brains of young people at different points, 22, 23, but there's mm -hmm. a point that everybody sort of talks about. My favorite line from Mark Twain was, um, uh, you know, my, my, uh, I was just amazed how stupid my father was when I was 16 <laughs> and how much I had taught him when I was 25. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there's that period of time, and that's what we call them teenagers. But it's just important. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ability to self-monitor. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And and I think the best dialogue for me has been, the best moments for me with this film, and it, it hasn't even come out nationally yet, but clips of the movie have been online. We've had half a million on one site. We've had 20 thousand, twenty five thousand views Good on the trailer, heavens. eighty thousand on another site, just because people are buzzing about it, which is huh. what we want. But more importantly, the the best dialogue that I've had is with people after they've gotten a chance to see the film and say, I never thought about things from this perspective mm. before and I'm ready to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And to me that's more important. I tell people mm -hmm. when I go to campuses it's more important that students voluntarily want to now talk about these issues out front. Mm -hmm. And I think giving them an image on a screen makes it easier because mm -hmm. they can say that's them and not necessarily me. Ah, but then they can work their issues vicariously point. out through what they call a catharsis in theater. I can see myself on stage mm -hmm. and go through everything positive and negative and then learn a life lesson that I can take with me without having to make the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So if people, now that they've seen the, the program and they go, wow, I really want to see this film, what's up with the film? How can they see it and do they just need to stay tuned or how do you? Stay tuned. Um, on Twitter, I'm, I'm at Jeff Okar. Uh, people can follow me there on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'm learning from my daughter that that's what you say. Follow me on Twitter. I'm, uh, I'm hip now. I'm hip. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do that, and we have a website, and it's real simple. You can just type in hazing, move, um, hazing film dot com. Wow. Hazing film. Hazing film dot com, and it'll take you to the website. The trailer's there. Uh, we'll be posting showtimes in cities once we secure our distribution deal in the way we want to. And our vision is to have everybody see it: college students, adults, mm. parents lawmakers, uh, policy uh, influencers. We want people to start talking about this movie because in addition to being uh, something that you can go and see and be affected, affected, and infected by in mm -hmm. many ways, it's something that you can take with you and share and have conversation beyond, oh, that was just a great movie. Mm -hmm. It's something that people can sit and have a conversation for days after, and I think that's the, that's the golden kind of ring that you search for as a filmmaker and as a storyteller, that mm -hmm. people will take it with them beyond just what they see in the theater. Mm -hmm. You shot it as a documentary, but it is written. I was just a little confused on, on its actors. It's not really a documentary. It's such. actors. It's, it's, a, it's a documentary. It's a docudrama. Okay. So one person knew where everything was going, and that was me. And people uh, begged to know where it was going. I refused to give it to them. I so there people, wasn't a script? There was no script except for the outline that was in my mind. It was a 38-point wow. outline that I had. And wow. each night that we got together, uh, we shot most of this in a 16 by 16 basement mm. uh, in the middle of the night wow. uh, in a harrowing period of about 11 days. And uh, every night we got together, I gave individual objectives for that particular scene. And then I gave group objectives. I gave a group objective for the big brothers and one for the guys who were pledging. And then I got together everybody and said, let's work on our objective. And of course, they each thought they were working on the same objective, but I'd given them conflicting <gasps> objectives. So wow. they worked harder and harder to get their objective, which created more conflict. And we had a safe word that I gave them to say in case things got too physically challenging. All the tears, the sweat, the emotional things that you see happen in the film are all real. It's not concocted. We didn't use vapors. We didn't do any huh. of that. Uh, and there were many times when I thought I was going to hear a safe word screamed. And uh, my heart was racing in many moments. Mm. And no one ever used a safe word. And that made me excited as a filmmaker. But talking after the final shoot, when I said, hey, we made it through this shoot, and all of this crazy stuff was going on, and nobody used a safe word. And one of the young guys said, 
okay, I'm gonna admit I wanted to use a safe word two or three times. I said, why didn't you? He said, I didn't want to be the guy to say it when everybody else, and uh -oh. I just sat down with my head between my legs. I said, my God, I've created what you what really happens. Right. What really happens. But and, yes, and that's, and that's what really happens. You're afraid to say anything, just like in Oops. Chip's instance, the other fraternity boys were afraid to say anything about Chip's son. They're right. Doing too many drugs and alcohol together. I mean, you just, you, you yeah. don't want to say it. You don't. And it's particularly strong with the males of the species. Right. Mm. We're trying so hard to be men at that point in time mm -hmm. that there is a, a level of machismo that we develop mm -hmm. that does that we do not want to be the weak link. Yeah. And even if we see somebody going down a road, we have this notion that we're telling on somebody and we're violating a sacred trust. Mm -hmm. And then we don't realize that the sacred trust should be to preserve life mm -hmm. um, and not to uh, protect something that could take that life away until it happens. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like, like Chip said, this is going to affect Chip forever. Hearing Chip's story and hearing about mm -hmm. Wilson is going to affect me forever mm -hmm. from this moment, as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, it's going to affect the people who were there. And that's mm -hmm. something that they'll never forget. It's always attached to the early part of their life and development. Uh, and that's tragic on some levels. But what you do with that knowledge, what you do with that information from that point, that's what makes it, uh, it worthwhile. And if you save lives as a result of mm -hmm. a moment of reflection, mm -hmm. then it means a beautiful thing. Well, that's what your movie's doing. Yes, well, indeed. Well, and, yes, and I, believe, is, I believe so. Do that. Yeah. And us mm -hmm. having this conversation here today. Mm -hmm. there, there might not be a million people that see it, and that's not necessarily important. It's the one person who sees that program, and they mm -hmm. say, you know, uh, 20 years later when they've made an incredible difference in mm -hmm. the world and they point to the moment that they were clicking through the channel and they saw Becky Mayer's transitions and they saw these two guys talking about hazing. It happens all the time. People will tell that story. Wow. Yes. And I, I was just inspired by listening to the two of you and my idea for a third show down the road <laughs> Uh, is talking about mentorship and being elders and, and helping the younger minds, the 19, 20, 22 year olds who need guidance, who want some discipline uh, and how can you do that now? Uh, and I think that would be a great show. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to, it's, it's time for us to end our t transitions and I want to thank you both for being here, particularly uh, say the title again. He Ain't Heavy. He Ain't Heavy and tweeting. Jeff O'Carr. Jeff O'Carr. Mm -hmm. Okay, stay tuned. Thank you both for being on Transitions. Thank you very much, Transitions. Mm -hmm.